Hey folks, welcome to lesson 36. I'm, uh, we've got two main things we have to do today. We have to learn how to add angular momenta. We have to learn about singlet states. And uh, we have to learn a little bit about reality. So, okay, let's get started. Suppose we have two spin one half particles and we wanna know what the total spin of the system is given that we have, that the system is composed of two spin one half particles. Now, you can think of two spin one half particles as having four possible combinations. They can both be spin up. You can have particle one spin up, particle two spin down, particle one spin down, particle two spin up, or they can both be spin down. Now I want to be clear about what I mean by this notation. When I say both particles are spin up, I mean what we have is one particle which has a spin of a half with its m value plus a half, and the other particle, which is also spin a half, has its m value plus a half. That x with a circle around it is uh, sometimes called the direct product operator. It just means that there are two particles and that any given state is a combination of the state of the two particles. So we'll see how that works out here in a minute. Uh, if you look at the down down <coughs> at the down down state, clearly uh, when you add two spin one halves together both pointing down you're going to get a spin of one and a z component of minus one. So if, you, if both spin one halves have a z component of minus a half, the total spin has to be minus one. The question is, uh, what happens when you look at the other spin states? How do those fit into the picture of a particle with a total spin of one? And, and just to be clear, when I say um, the uh, the spin is one. I mean, I have a particle with a spin of one, a, a system with a spin of one, and a z component of spin of minus one, and we're thinking of that as a direct product of two spin one half particles, each of which has their z component of spin pointing down. That's the idea. So the question is, um, oh, and the shorthand. Look at that complicated business. The shorthand for that is one minus one. S is 1, M is minus 1, is the same thing as two spin 1 half particles with their spins pointing down. So there's two different notations going on. There's the SM notation, and then there's the spin of particle 1, spin of particle 2 notation. I'll try to be clear about those two different notations, and when I have to be explicit, I'll try to break it out and make it very explicit. You can think of this state, the two spin down states, as kind of like uh, a downward pointing cone with two spin one half particles pointing down making a spin one system with the spin pointing down. How do we figure out what the next state is, the state with spin of one and z component of spin of zero? Uh, the easiest way to do that is to apply the s plus operator. You already know what happens when you apply the s plus operator to a particle, to a system with a spin of one you get a system with a spin of one with a z component of spin of zero instead of minus one. And there's a factor out in front that's determined by the values of s and m, and that factor in this case works out to be h bar times the square root of two. But notice I can also apply the s plus operator uh, <coughs> as the sum of the s plus operator acting on the first spin and the s plus operator acting on the second spin. In other words, I can look at the individual S plus operators that act on the individual spin one half particles and see what that gets me. If I do that, you can work it out. It turns out uh, the S plus one operator flips the spin of the first uh, spin one half particle and does nothing to the second spin, the down spin of the second particle. And the S plus two, the one that acts on the second particle, flips the spin of the second particle but does nothing to the spin of the first particle. And that's the way it works. You end up with a state that looks like up down plus down up. And there's a multiple of h bar. But these two states must in fact be the same state because I applied s plus to the down down state to the one minus one state. It's the same state. I must have the same state. So if I set those two equal to each other, I get the following result. That one zero is in fact nothing other than up down plus down up over the square root of two. And that is, in fact, correct. That state, you could think of it as kind of a jackknife state where the two spins add and uh, you get a z component of spin of zero, but the total spin is one, okay? 
And finally, what happens if I apply S plus to this state again? Well, uh, as you can guess, I, the S plus increases the value of M from 0 to plus 1, and I get another factor of the square root of 2. But if you look at what happens when you apply S plus 1 plus S plus 2 to the superposition state, um, it turns out S plus 1 acting on the first state gives me nothing because s plus acting on up uh, gives you nothing it can't go any higher than up but the second state gives me something it gives me up up and the similar thing happens with the s2 I get up up and when the whole thing is done I end up with the square root of 2 times up up and that means that up up must be the same thing as 1 comma 1 so what we found is that there's another state a state with uh, s equals 1 where both the spins are pointing up so the only kind of goofy state is the state in the middle the m equals 0 state that has to be a superposition of up down and down up and you might have noticed we've actually left the state out here but let's summarize what we've discovered we have found a triplet of three states which is appropriate for a spin of one uh, a down down a superposition of up down and down up and an up up and those correspond to s equals 1 m equals minus 1 s equals 1 m equals 0 s equals 1 m equals plus 1 now there is a state we've left out there's another combination of up down and down up that's orthogonal to this one and that one turns out to be up down minus down up the anti-symmetric combination of up and down and uh, Griffiths does a nice job of showing that that is a singlet that's a state with no angular momentum and with no z component of angular momentum. What I'm going to have you guys do on the board today is to express that singlet state in the x basis. It turns out in the x basis it also looks like up down minus down up except it's up in the x direction for the first particle and down in the x direction for the second particle minus down in the x direction for the first particle and up in the x direction for the second particle. And in fact, it turns out that it's the same expression for the singlet in any basis. You can pick any direction you like as your basis, and you'll get up, down, minus down, up along that direction for the singlet state. So the singlet state is uh, kind of special in the sense that it has exactly the same form in every basis. Not true of the triplet state. The triplet state, um, if you have a particle that's down down in the z basis it won't be down down in the x basis or the y basis it'll be some superposition of down down and up up and down up and up down <coughs> all right so the singlet looks very special it's isotropic it looks the same from every direction and that's the reason we're interested in it both the 0 0 and the 1 0 state are also special states they're called entangled states that is the up and the down state are entangled. Uh, they're inherent superpositions. You can't, you can't rewrite them as anything but a superposition state. So they're, uh, they're useful for problems that involve what's called entanglement. Um, here's an idea. What if you start with a particle in the singlet state and ask what's the amplitude of measuring a particle in some specific direction? For example, let's say we want to measure particle 1 in some specific direction given that we're starting out in the singlet state. Uh, let's look at what happens. If I measure particle 1, if I calculate the amplitude of finding particle 1 in a particular direction, I can simply hit that singlet state with the bra that refers to that particular direction. So I rewrite our arbitrary direction uh, spin state uh, as a bra, which means I have to use e to the minus i phi 1, multiply that all out, and look what I get. I get uh, 1 over the square root of 2, cosine theta over 2 with the second particle pointing down, minus e to the minus i phi 1 times the sine of theta two over 2 with particle 2 pointing up. So I haven't really got a total amplitude because I've only actually calculated the amplitude for measuring particle 1. I've left particle 2 free. But notice that um, the amplitude of particle 2 being up or down now depends on theta and phi. The theta and phi along which I measured the direction of the spin of particle 1. 
I want to rewrite this a little bit. I'm going to factor out um, the a complex exponential. I want to change it so that the the amplitude of particle two being up is real. Remember, I can multiply the whole thing by a phase, and I will still have the same uh, quantum state. So I'm going to multiply by e to the plus i phi one. Actually, I'm going to multiply by minus e to the plus i phi one. That'll get rid of the minus sign and get rid of the phase. And I also want to notice something. Um, the cosine of theta over two is the same thing as the sine of pi minus theta over two. And the sine of pi minus of theta over two is the cosine of pi minus theta over two. So I want to rewrite that state using the cosine of pi minus theta over two times particle two being up and the sine of pi minus theta over two times the particle two being down. And I want you to notice that uh, this looks kind of interesting. This looks like the state where particle two is, has its spin pointing in the pi minus theta direction and, ha and in the phi one plus pi direction. But if you think about it, you'll realize that that means its spin is pointing in exactly the opposite direction of the direction in which we measured particle one. So the consequence of that is if you measure particle one pointing in a direction, particle two will automatically be pointing in exactly the opposite direction. Now you may be wondering about that one over the square root of two in front. That just refers to the fact that we measured the uh, s particle one being spin up in a particular direction and the probability of that happening turns out to be a half. If you pick a random direction in space and measure the spin of either of the particles in a singlet state in that direction, half of the time it'll be spin up and half of the time it'll be spin down. That's just a feature of the singlet, sp singlet state. But what we found is that if you do make that measurement, the other particle will definitely be pointing in the opposite direction. So that is a fascinating result, and that is a result that uh, we're going to take advantage of. This process we've used actually is a generic process. Um, it turns out you can express any uh, superposition of two spins, a combination of two spins, um, in a similar way. Uh, if J1 and J2 are the spins of the two particles with uh, Z components M1 and M2, and you want to know what the total angular momentum and the, to and the total Z component is, you can call that capital J and capital M. You can, you can use the fact that the uh, individual spin states must form a complete set to form an identity operator. You stick that identity operator in, and you see that you can write the superposition state, or the total angular momentum state, as a superposition of the individual spin states of the two particles. The coefficients that get calculated in that case, the inner product between J1, J2, M1, M2, and capital J and capital M, are called Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. So, and just to be clear, little j1, little j2 are the spins of the individual particles making up the combination. Little m1, little m2 are their z components. Capital J is the total angular momentum added together, and capital M is the z component of the total angular momentum added together. And uh, so that's the way that works. There, uh, you can see that we've actually done this because we've written 0, 0 as a superposition of up, down, and down, up. But up, down, and down, up are nothing other than j1 is a half, j2 is a half, m1 is plus a half, m2 is minus a half, and j1 is plus a half, j2 is plus a half, j m1 is minus a half, and m2 is plus a half. So uh, what we actually discovered was that the one Klebsch-Gordon coefficient was plus one over the square root of two, the other Klebsch-Gordon coefficient was minus one over the square root of two. If you look in the book or you look online, you can find tables of these things. This is a one page out of a very large table of Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. It looks pretty intimidating. I want to point out that, in fact, uh, we found a couple of elements out of this uh, one example, and the elements look like this. The uh, Klebsch-Gordon coefficient we found was plus one over the square root of two and minus one over the square root of two, 
if you look at the table, the values of little j and little m and big J and big M are all listed in the table. So once you learn how to find where things fit in, they're not too bad. Now, honestly, we're not going to do very much with these guys, but I just wanted to point out that they exist and that you can add any two angular momenta together, and these tables of Klepsch-Gordon coefficients will tell you the magic combinations that it takes to form a, a total angular momentum out of individual uh, angular momenta. Okay, now let's move on from that, uh, and let's talk about logic. Okay, uh, why am I talking about logic? Because it turns out entanglement produces some situations in which ordinary classical logic seems to fail. So you guys have all seen Venn diagrams. Let's say we had uh, situation A, situation B, and situation C, and a collection of events, some of which, some of which f uh, have A true, some of which have B true, some of which have C true, and some of which have combinations of A, B, and C all being true. Now, uh, there's a statement that you can make in, lo in classical logic that is going to be very obvious, obviously true, uh, and involves A, B, and C. So first let's consider the situation A and not B. Of all the events that I've drawn there, which ones have the property A and not the property B? Well, clearly it's these ones here, the ones that fall in the A circle but don't also fall in the B circle. And there's a similar bit of logic if you want to consider B and not C. So which ones fall in B but not C? It's got to be these ones, the ones that aren't in, a, that aren't in uh, C but are in B. And finally, what about A and not C? Those ones are these guys. They're inside the circle A, but they're excluded from the circle C. Okay? Now if you think about these, uh, I, you can make a clear and obvious statement that if, if A and not B uh, is added to B and not C, then if you take all the events that have the property A but not the property B, and you add to them all the events that have the property B and not the property C, it's got to be greater than or equal to those that have the property A and not the property C. In other words, these events added to these events are always going to be greater in number than these events. And you can see that uh, the events on the right are all included on the left, but in addition you have uh, some events that uh, aren't included on the right. So that means that the uh, sum of those two guys has to be greater. That's the idea. So um, and that's basically the statement. You can see that there's some that are in B uh, but aren't in A and some that are in C that aren't in A that are included on the left that are not included on the right. That's, uh, that's basically the idea. Now, let's imagine we have two particles that are entangled in a singlet and we do an experiment where one of the particles moves off to the right and the other particle moves off to the left. Maybe a hydrogen atom decays or something <coughs> or falls apart for some reason. Um, we're going to let situation A be that particle 1 is spin up in the zero degree direction. Situation B is going to be particle 1 is spin up at 45 degrees. And situation C is going to be that particle 1 is spin up at 90 degrees. In other words, if we have an apparatus, a Stieringer lock or something, that can measure spin, we can dial it to 0, 45, or 90 degrees. And the situation A, B, and C is that particle 1 is got its spin up in one of those three directions. Okay. Now, what about not A? Well, not A means particle 1 is spin down in the zero degree direction, but because the particles are entangled, if particle A is spin down in the zero degree direction, then particle 2, particle 1, I should say, is spin down in the zero degree direction, then particle 2 will be spin up. So not A is that particle 2 is spin up at zero degrees. Not B is that particle 2 is spin up at 45 degrees. Not C is that particle 2 is spin up at 90 degrees. So you see, if you make a statement about particle 2, it's the not of particle 1, if particle 1 and particle 2 are entangled with one another. So you can think of A and not B is that particle 1 is at 0 degrees, 
and particle 2 is at 45 degrees. And B and not C is particle 1 is at 45 degrees and particle 2 is at 90 degrees. And A and not C is particle 1 is at 0 degrees and particle 2 is at 90 degrees. That's what those guys mean. Now, quantum mechanically, we can calculate the amplitude that we have A and not B. First of all, the condition A and not B is that particle 1 is at 0, particle 2 is at 45. So we can use our s generic state vector that we worked out before to figure out what the amplitude or what the quantum state would be for that situation to exist. We know that the initial state is the singlet state of particle 1 and particle 2, and we can simply compute what's the amplitude particle 1 being at 0, particle 2 being at 45, given that they start out in this singlet state. I want you to notice that particle 1 only interacts with the first term in the singlet state because it's got its spin pointing up. And in that term, particle 2 is pointing down. And so only the particle 2 pointing down part of the generic 45 degree angle state counts. And so when the smoke clears, it's quite easy. The amplitude is simply the sine of 45 divided by 2 divided by the square root of 2. You calculate that number, you get about 0.271. Now, what about the next one? What about B and not C? That means particle 1 is at 45, particle 2 is at 90. But notice, it's only the relative angle between the two that counts. So we, we could actually work this out, um, but we don't really need to because we know it's got to be the same result because we could simply shift our z-axis to point along particle 1, and then particle 2 would be at 45 degrees again, and we'd have to get the same result. So it, you can do it if you want to, but trust me, it works out to be the same. Um, now, what about A and not C? That means that particle 1 is pointing up, particle 2 is pointing at 90 degrees. That's also straightforward to compute. Um, and we have the same basic situation, except now it's the sine of 90 over 2. Of course, 90 over 2 is 45, and the sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. And so when you work that out, you get an amplitude of exactly a half. So let's go back and check our logic and see how it turns out. A and not B, B and not C, the amplitude for those events was 0.271, I just have to square that to get a probability, and uh, each of them has the same probability, so I multiply by 2, and I get about 14.7, almost 15% is the probability of those two things taken together. So if I actually did the experiment, I'd have a bunch of events. I could measure event A, I can measure event, uh, I can measure events that correspond to A and not B, events that correspond to B and not C, and if I added up all those events, about 15% of the time, one of these two conditions would be satisfied. Then the other thing I could do is check for A and not C. If I did that, though, I'd find that 25% of the time that condition would be satisfied. And if you notice, 25% is bigger than 15% by about 10%. So I would have a... Uh, violation of simple classical logic of about a 10% effect. And if I do it long enough, then I can be uh, very sure that this is a real effect. And it had this experiment has essentially been done, and it's been shown that the quantum mechanical result is correct, and the uh, classical logic turns out to be wrong. There's another way to look at this. It's called Merman's Reality Machine. This was an invention of David Merman. Um, a similar situation, you have uh, two entangled particles in a singlet state, and you send them through a machine. The machine has, it's basically three, uh, it's a Sterringer lock apparatus with three switch settings, up 120 degrees to the right and 120 degrees to the left. And then on the other side of the experiment, you have an oppositely configured uh, machine that's got its uh, switch settings so that the Sterringer lock is pointing down, 120 degrees clockwise and 120 degrees counterclockwise from that. And you'll notice that because of the orientation of these guys, um, if a particle goes through the left Sterringer lock and goes up, the particle going through the right Sterringer lock will definitely be pointing down. And so if the switch settings are both set to 1, both machines will measure, yes, the particle is pointing in that direction with 100% probability. Now, 
the way the machine works is if if the switch setting is pointing up and the particle goes through and has its spin measured pointing up it flashes a green light if the switch setting is pointing down and the particle goes through and measures the spin pointing down it flashes a green light on the other hand if the switch setting is up and the particle goes through and it doesn't measure its spin in the up direction the red light will flash okay that's the way the thing works and you'll notice that because of the orientation of the different switch settings if both machines are set to one uh, both lights will either flash green or both lights will flash red in other words if particle if the particle goes through Sternger lock one and it's measured with its spin going up the other particle will definitely have its spin going down and it will definitely flash green if the uh, particle one goes through the Sternger lock and it doesn't measure its spin pointing up that means it spins pointing down that means the other particle will definitely have its spin pointing up and both lights will flash red so the, the rule is that if the switch settings are the same both lights will always flash the same color now if you only look at one machine 50 percent of the time it'll flash green and 50 percent of the time it'll flash red and that's a simple consequence of the fact that if you if you only measure one of the spins and you only care about one of the spins it'll be a likely equally likely to be spin up or spin down and that's always true no matter what but if you have the switch settings on a different setting in reality uh, well actually we'll work out the the math of how it turns out but quantum mechanically it turns out only a quarter of the time will they end up with the same color and three quarters of the time they'll have different color now what Merman realized is that you could imagine a classical model of this situation in which the particles have some kind of gene some kind of embedded hidden information that nobody knows about in fact Einstein was a big fan of this hidden information he felt that quantum mechanics wasn't complete that there must be some hidden uh, genetic code or some hidden gears and wheels that we didn't know about yet that if we only could figure out what the hidden gears were we could predict the results of experiments um, exactly and it would be a complete theory that would tell us exactly what was going on inside and we could figure out uh, what was happening um, so Merman said, well, look, what if embedded in these particles when they're born, they have some kind of DNA and the DNA is shared by both of the particles. And what the DNA tells us is what color the thing's going to flash when the switch settings have certain values. So, for example, there are eight combinations of red, green and blue that are possible. So if we had a particle with the gene GGG, that would mean that no matter what the switch settings were, um, you would always measure green. Uh, but if you had GGR, it would be switch setting one would be green, switch setting two would be green, switch setting three would be red. Notice what this does. Um, if the switch settings are the same, you always get the same color. That's consistent with the quantum mechanical model. Um, also, it has the property that uh, if you just, no matter what the switch settings are, if you look at only one uh, reality machine, you always get 50% green and 50% red because all these combinations, if you only look at one switch setting, there's half green and half red in each column of this, uh, this set of genes. However, if you have different switch settings, according to this plan, um, half of the time the color will be the same and half of the time the color will be different. In other words, this this uh, model, this classical model, fails to predict the quantum mechanical result that when the switch settings are different, only 25% of the time do the colors flash the same and 75% of they, f they flash different. Now you can work out a genetic code that has the property that when the switch settings are different, the, the uh, thing turns out to be 25% the same and 75% and different. The bad news is when you go back to having the switch settings the same, it won't predict what we see in nature, which is that the colors are always the same and um, the individual uh, probabilities on any one machine are always 50% green and 50% red. So there's no classical uh, model that produces the uh, quantum results. So according to this plan, 
it correctly does the same switch positions, but it doesn't correctly get the different switch positions. If you make it work for the different positions, it fails to correctly predict the same switch positions. So that's the uh, that's the main point of both of those guys. We will uh, we'll try to reproduce some of these results on the board today. I hope you guys made some sense out of all that, and we'll see you next time.